Um, I'm very pleased to welcome today our speaker, Sally. Um, Sally is a, a communities developer, development researcher at FabLab Barcelona. And she will be talking today to us a little bit about FabLab and the projects, um, especially those involving communities. Um, so without any further ado, Sally, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ola, and thank you to you and Veronica for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all and to be speaking with you today. So as Ola said, I am a communities development researcher at FabLab Barcelona. Um, basically, that means I just do a lot of different activities to support different types of communities uh, and also working on community interventions um, that are co-created and, and bottom up. Um, and in addition to um, to doing uh, some talks like this, uh, I'm working on a project called Distributed D Design, uh, which you probably got to know a bit the other week with Jessica Guy. And I'm also working on another project called Food Shift 2030. Um, and both of these from the from this uh, place of trying to see how we can best support the communities that we're working with. So for a distributed design platform in the case of um, supporting young creatives and designers like yourselves and in food shift it's supporting the food tech uh, community. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, here. Let's see. Okay, can you all see that. Yep. Okay. Yeah, perfect. it's fine. Perfect. Um, okay. So, um, so what is FabLab Barcelona? Uh, we are an innovation center rethinking the way we live, work, and play in cities. Um, this is a pretty big definition, but I think it really touches on the many different areas that our team is involved in that I'll get into a little bit more. Um, I'm going to give kind of a, a brief intro to FabLab Barcelona and how it is that we work. Um, and then I'm going to go into three examples of how we're working with ideas around community engagement um, before taking us to some tools that you might be able to use with your own work. Um, so once again, we're in an innovation center, rethinking the way we live, work and play in cities. Um, we are all about tackling the current paradigm, which is uh, based on what we call PIDO or product in and trash out of a space like a city or town. Um, you're bringing a lot of different products in uh, and then just producing trash, which then these products and that trash is going all over the world. And we want to move to a, a ditto model. So data in and data out, as opposed to moving physical products, we move data between different nodes around the world. And that's how we share information um, about how you can do or make just about anything. Um, so we are part of a network of more than 2000 fab labs uh, around the world. Um, so fab lab is a digital fabrication laboratory. Um, the all for every fab lab that exists, there's kind of a different way of working. Um, so in our case, uh, we're working with a lot of EU research. We're working with education programs. Um, working with business development as well, uh, but there are some fab labs that are, you know, serving smaller communities and um, working in more rural areas that are places more for people to come and make uh, the items that they need uh, or for hobbyists and and basically the idea is that every fab lab has their own way of working so we're, we're a very diverse network, um, but this still sharing this goal of. Uh, trying to change the way that we make. Um, so the mission of FabLab is to provide access to the tools, knowledge, and means to educate, innovate, and invent using technology and digital fabrication to allow anyone to make almost anything. Um, a few kind of quick highlights is that we're a leader in educational programs and design and architecture. Um, we are, I think now that number is a, is a bit higher, uh, but we have been part of at least 18 different EU, EU research projects since 2014 in our inception. Um, we are the first fab lab in the European Union 
and we're leading the Fab City Global Initiative. The Fab City Initiative is about um, helping cities transition uh, from this product in trash out model to the data in data out model. And the idea is that this group of now 49 cities will um, hopefully be much more self-sufficient by the year 2054. Um, and then we do work with a lot of different clients um, local and international, and some of those names include Red Bull, Ikea, um, Raqqa, and Puj. Um, so at Fab Lab, uh, we sort of operate through the lens of eight different strategic areas, which are productive cities, sense-making, distributed design, future learning, ecological interactions, materials and textiles, and emergent futures. Um, really, these inter interconnect and overlap um, quite a lot, so we do future learning with distributed design, we do ecological interactions with emergent futures, um, but these are just some of the ways that we try to organize around uh, what it is that we are trying to do. And um, we are tackling these strategic areas through these three pillars, which are education, um, so leading programs like uh, Fab Academy, which is a six-month program um, to allow you to develop a project. Uh, and our master's program, our master's in design for emergent futures, which Ola is actually an alumnus of. Um, we also have our re research and innovation side. Uh, I'm working on um, more of the research team and we get involved in EU projects, um, local research grants as well, Erasmus Plus, Creative Europe, these different types of um, uh, research opportunities that we're really fortunate to be able to take advantage of being in Spain and Europe. Um, and then lastly, we have a branch that's more about products and services. Um, so companies might come to us and ask to develop a training uh, or a boot camp for a group of creatives. And so we do services like this as well. Um, so what is it that we are actually doing? Um, so we're trying to prepare for uncertain and emergent futures uh, by designing citizen and community led uh, and driven solutions. Um, so what that looks like for us is um, engaging with a, a group or community most of the time and co-defining a challenge of what that community is challenge or what it is that they have to work on and then co-creating a bottom-up strategy together with the community on how um, we can look to bring solutions to that challenge um, we're all about trying to engage and empower communities and meeting them where they're at um, and coming up with solutions that will really um, help and it will enable them uh, to then lead the charge themselves um, for us, it doesn't work if we just come and say, hey, you, we're going to come up with a solution for you and then drop it on a group of people because it might not actually fit the needs they have. Um, and then once we go away, how do we know that they have then the skills to carry on implementing that solution? Um, so we find that by uh, co-defining and co-creating strategies together, it makes much more resilient communities as well. And then, of course, we proto prototype, iterate, and repeat to test out solutions, see how they're working, adjusting them, and then doing that whole process over again. So co-creating um, community solutions. What does this look like? So now we're going to get into some of the examples. Um, and before I do, though, I, I do want to mention some questions that we try to keep in mind. Um, when we are working with communities, whatever that community would look like. Um, recently, I was in a uh, one of our, our master's uh, seminar classes, and I really liked how the um, speaker um, summarized the set of questions of who is allowed to articulate from where, from what position, and for what, or for what reason. Um, and these are, I think, three really key questions to keep in mind when it comes to um, working with communities and engaging them and, and working to empower them and finding solutions that are really going to be by the community and for the community. Um, we have to recognize uh, who you are as either a researcher coming from a space like FabLab, as a designer, um, what are the 
the kind of structural um, the structures around that allow you to be articulating the solution. So for us, it's acknowledging the privilege that we are coming from a, a context of being able to work on EU projects, having access to those opportunities. Um, and that also kind of deals with from where. Uh, we are a, a, um, a fab lab located in Spain, in the global north, in um, a, a context that is not always the same for the communities that we're working with. So we, it's really important to be able to acknowledge these things as well. Um, and for what reason are we engaging? Um, what is the, uh, the purpose of the engagement? Um, what kinds of solutions are we looking for? And then kind of a group of other questions that when it comes to thinking about um, how to engage with the community, are, is there already a community? So if you are developing a solution or a project, um, as opposed to starting the project itself and developing that right away, and then looking for a community that might want to use it, um, or starting your own community, we kind of try to ask ourselves, well, is there a community that already exists um, that is in line with what we were working on and how can we collaborate with the existing community and meet them where they're at. So instead of coming to them with a solution and or with a tool with technology going to them first seeing where they are understanding their needs and their context. Another question to ask as well is what benefits or added value will collaboration extend the community um, being really critical of okay is this relationship um, only going to have benefits for me? Hopefully not. Hopefully it will also have benefits for the community. So it's essential as well to ask yourself this question before starting out. Um, and then what will relationship with the community look like on the short and long term? Uh, what is the input and in, at what stages and uh, for how long um, will the community be engaged? Um, and what will the relationship look like after introducing a tool or a project, for example? And then lastly, who is missing? So who is missing from your side on, on uh, doing the intervention and who is missing in the community space? So if you're working with a community, for example, in an urban garden, um, you might try to notice, are there children? Are there elderly people? Do you have a range of ages? Are there a mix of ethnicities and races? Are there um, people from different economic backgrounds? So who is in the space and who isn't there is equally and oftentimes, if not more important. Um, so the three examples that I'll be going through, excuse me, just one moment. Um, so the three examples that I'll be going through are going to be um, interventions that are at a person level, and that example will come from our Masters in Design for Emergent Futures and some work that our students are doing there. Um, the next uh, example will be about, it says project level there, but it should say a neighborhood or community level um, with the project syscode, one of the EU projects that we've had the pleasure to work on, and then at a uh, at the last level, we have a community or network level. Um, so we'll be talking about uh, Fab Labs for Precious Plastic, which is another community. So um, this first example is, like I said, with our Masters in Design for Emergent Futures. Um, it's uh, our students in this Masters um, are sort of tasked with designing real world interventions in communities. Um, so unlike a lot of design programs nowadays, which uh, many times have you designing something in the classroom, we ask our students to go into communities and see how a design can be co-created with the community um, and what that whole process looks like to try to encourage them to design um, solutions that in the end might be more effective and might help establish um, more resilient communities. So it, really interestingly with our masters, um, we ask students from the very beginning to position themselves and try to understand what their, we call it kind of what their fight will be. Um, so will they be uh, 
working with questions around decolonizing design? Will they be working with uh, rural futures, um, carbon neutral lifestyles? We really ask them to try to understand like from what place are you uh, tackling your interventions and what is motivating you to design from that place? Um, and this process also kind of goes through or helps our students go through this kind of change in mindset um, where they're going from what one of our collaborators in, in the Food Shift Project calls an ego mindset, where you are thinking really with your own thought, like well, thinking with your own thoughts maybe sounds redundant, um, but thinking with the thoughts that you've always had and maybe the biases you've always had and going to an echo for um, uh, ecosystem mindset and really trying to connect how how you are and who you are with the larger ecosystem and not seeing yourself in isolation. So when we're asking students to kind of decide on what this the fight is, um, we're also encouraging them to go through this process and see how that fight can be connected at an ecosystem level. So already encouraging them to um, start connecting with communities from the very beginning in that way. Um, so with the interventions themselves, um, we also ask our students to think about um, different scales. So designing for multi-scalar strategies. So you have like the, pers the person level, home, neighborhood, city, country, or region, and planet, uh, which would be obviously the, the biggest um, uh, uh, group that could be worked with. Um, and to understand the motivations um, that you have for your intervention at each of these levels, and then the effects that the intervention will have at each of those levels as time goes on. So one of the examples from this year's Masters in Design for Emergent Futures students um, is a project called Co-Creating Futures with Children. Um, so this group of students, Ariel, Jimena, and Wen, um, have been I basically posed the question um, of trying to understand how uh, and, and what children see for their future. Because a lot of the conversations that happen around future and futuring um, are happening by adults in certain spheres um, and children very often are not or are excluded from those spaces. Um, so they were asking themselves, for example, this question of who is missing, and they found, well, children are missing. Um, so they're working to co-create and imagine futures with and for children in public spaces and schools in Barcelona to not only understand their attitudes, but they're also their perceptions towards the future. Um, so Ariel, Jimena, and Wen, uh, each of them kind of took an area of interest, so climate change, gender equality, and mental health and asked students to try to imagine um, what uh, things would look like. For example, they asked them, what would a zoo look like in 2050? Or what would a school look like in 2050? Um, and some of the things they found were like that, um, that the children they were working with uh, we're really interested in interspecies um, schools and interspecies futures that had animals playing like a really large part of um, kind of the social network. Um, so this was just one of their findings and they've been piloting this, um, this exercise and now they've done pilots in three schools in Barcelona and really working at like from a, a personal level um, with students and then seeing then their collective visions. So another example that we have um, is the syscode project, um, which came up with two, um, well, kind of two versions of prototypes. And the one that I'll talk a little bit more about is El Barri Circular and well, also Remix El Barrio. So I guess I'll talk about two. Uh, but this is the example of um, interventions at a neighborhood and community level. Um, so the, the project Syscode is a project focused on developing co-creation and circular economy journeys to design um, solutions. And um, what this looked like at the start 
uh, in this first phase called El Barri Circular, which means the circular neighborhood in Catalan. Um, it looked like our team um, going to community spaces and inviting community members in um, to understand the needs of the neighborhood and at the same time uh, understand the resources available. And so the idea was try to um, in the end, experiment with projects and rethink the models of transformations and interactions between the actors involved, so the different community members. Um, so our role then was to really facilitate this space for neighbors to gather, reflect on the needs that they had, reflect on the different types of resources that they had available, and then try to start designing solutions that were around their needs combined with these resources. So um, what we ended up doing um, was um, the, or was identifying with the community what their challenge was. So they decided as a community that their challenge was identifying and stimulating new synergies among the local community for redistributing, upcycling, and composting food locally. Um, so this involves neighborhood associations, local restaurants, urban gardens, maker spaces, material designers, cooperatives in the city of Barcelona. And uh, the solution in the end um, was putting together um, a, a first stage of trying to explore um, the food waste materials. And this led to a first prototyping loop where uh, the um, the community decided, well, you know, we want to take food waste and we want to start making biomaterials from it. And so our team um, said, OK, that is what you have decided. So we facilitated uh, a series of workshops to help the, um, the community members uh, learn about biomaterials, learn about how to develop them um, and begin to develop them themselves. And then this kind of gave way to a second round of the project, um, which was then called Remix El Barrio. So we have the El Barrio Circular, the circular neighborhood was the phase of decide, defining what the challenge was and beginning to explore this potential solution of making um, biomaterials. And then the second round is called Remix El Barrio, which was basically an incubation program um, for seven projects uh, and, and 12 people from the community um, who had started working with biomaterials and then got uh, or stuck on an idea um, that they wanted to develop further. So we provided lab training, um, like both in technical and capacities and on community engagement, community building um, to help these different, uh, these different projects um, really come together. And the product of this um, was that it gave way to nine circular food projects, some were focused on materials, others on products. Um, it also allowed us to see like the stories of the community members themselves and how they see themselves in the neighborhood. It also led to the creation of a book um, that was all of the recipes of the biomaterials that the group was working on. And it's also a series of videos um, so that we share openly um, to help uh, people understand how you can actually make these biomaterials themselves. Um, and it also paved the way for really amazing local cooperation. Um, so this collective of people uh, who participated in Remix El Barrio, they formed in the end a design collective um, that includes the, the seven projects that were, or the nine projects that were involved in, um, in the program. And now they are participating in all sorts of different events. Um, and the designers themselves individually also have participated in different EU projects um, and were part of the, uh, the Capital Alimentación 2030 and El Posa Melque Fast. They applied for grants and won them as this collective as well. Um, so this really nice example from this project is, uh, is one of the collectives called Nye Factory. Um, so Nye Factory is a, a kind of an, an experimental um, design laboratory 
And prior to engaging with um, Syscode and El Barrio Circular and um, Remix El Barrio, they had never worked with um, the duo that is behind them, had never worked with biomaterials. And they literally just saw the flyer and said, that looks interesting. Um, and then uh, started applying their design work, um, which is a lot to do with ephemeral design uh, to biomaterials or rather applying biomaterials to their design work. Um, so they used principally uh, olive pits. So the, the bone of olives, uh, which we eat a lot of olives <laughs> in Spain uh, and between like olive oil production and just a lot of olives in general. Um, and they were using the pits of the olives to produce um, different objects like you see here, like this little, some more kind of ornamental, um, but others as parts of lamps, like this um, this sort of gelatin looking thing uh, that is part of the lamp is also made of well, gelatins in, um, in olive pits too. Um, and they also took their biomaterial learnings and um, developed a series of um signage for our uh for the design hub in barcelona um so completely ink free and uh, biodegradable signs that are being used in the design museum right now um and something else that they're also doing too is they are reaching out to other communities and trying to empower other communities. So it's this community that was created is then trying to now upscale and uh, or build capacity in other groups of communities. Um, for example, there's this group um, called uh, Tresores de Edona, uh, which means like tre treasures of women in, in Spanish. Um, but it's a group of migrant women um, that did not have many um, uh, opportunities for being hired um, and they taught them how to uh, create biomaterials and now so now this um, group of women is also able to develop similar tools and market those tools so the last example that i have um, is how uh, we are also working on community engagement from network perspective. So we talked about on like a person level, we talked about on a community or neighborhood level, um, and we also engage with community engagement from um, seeing how we as a Fab Lab network can connect to and support other networks. Um, so the example within that is um, the work that we're doing or the prototyping that we're doing at Fab Lab Barcelona around precious plastics. So Precious Plastics is a uh, massive worldwide community that is uh, dedicated to um, uh, collecting uh, plastic waste and then turning that plastic waste into new materials. Um, so they host workshops. They've also developed a series of machinery that are all open source um, so that anyone that has access to a makerspace um, and has the, the right tools can make these more low tech machines to then be um, upcycling uh, plastic waste. Um, and they have quite a, an ample community that's contributing um, other open source solutions or designs. Um, you see everything from glasses to chairs to carabiners um, that are all being openly shared. So what we're doing from Fab Lab's perspective is seeing how um, we can um, adopt and adapt the different machines that Precious Plastic has created and how we can share that with the, the Fab Lab um, ecosystem so that they can, uh, other Fab Labs can understand how they can engage um, with uh, initiatives like Precious Plastic. Um, so how we're doing this is um, is really trying to like document our whole process and actively share it of how we are um, how we are building the tools, what modifications we're making, and how are we installing it in our space in a way that is meeting our community's needs um, and 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 for us that it's meant creating quite a flexible space that can really adapt to the community's needs at different moments. 
Um, and then also how we're working on trying to create co-ownership and responsibility of the plastic, um, the precious plastic space in our lab and create a collective vision for that. So we've been prototyping with our, our own team of how we do this, of um, how we can collectively as a team take uh, ownership together of this space and the, the way that it will continue to develop. And then once again, actively sharing this with other fab labs so that there is a model for them to follow when it comes to um, fab lab that might be interested in engaging with precious plastic. So having gone through all of those um, examples, I wanted to focus on a few tools that you can engage with to really help you on this community engagement journey. Um, so I'm going to briefly stop sharing this. Oh, no, actually, I didn't mean to do that. Oops, one second. Um, get back here. Um, so we are currently um, developing a, uh, I'm currently working on the development of a, uh, a Git book, so an online book for um, a this project that I'm also part of called Food Shift 2030. And there we've tried to collect a group of resources um, to help innovators, designers, um, and community members as well understand how they can create um, citizen driven initiatives and really plan for community engagement from the very beginning. Um, so within this tool, and I included the link at the end of the PowerPoint, which I can send to you all um, as well. Um, so we have different tools, like some of those that came out of developing the syscode project. Um, within this area of community, we kind of go through these like four steps of first understanding your stakeholders and we include some tools for there so one for example doing stakeholder personas so who is this person that you're trying to engage with what are reasons that they do or might not want to engage um what is their personality their interests so this is kind of like a quite a standard tool that you also see with a lot of business development plans um but then we also have resources like the stakeholder map um, which is then about taking those uh, those different profiles and trying to understand what level of engagement they're going to have in your work. So if they're going to be part of um, co-managing the, the actual work itself, are they going to be co-producing? Are they going to be co-designing? Are they more in a consulting role? Um, or are you going to just be informing them? So it helps you then plot out these different stakeholders and see what roles they can play. Um, the next tool that we have, or it's really a group of tools, then understanding and exploring community. So the idea is that um, you can kind of see a few different communities, like the Remix Helvario one that I mentioned, um, and Precious Plastic as well, and um, ask yourself kind of different questions that you might have around those communities, and then going through this next step of um, trying to identify a community uh, that you might want to work with, trying to understand their purpose um, as a community, what is their identity, uh, their experience and contributions, like what do they go through, what is it that they might, um, how is it that you might create value for this uh, group of community members, um, structure and activities. So what are structure or activities rather that the community already has going on and what are activities that you would like to do with them and collaborate with them on. Um, and then lastly are our values. So what are the, the values that are or the principles that are really important to this community? And the idea is that not having all of this information thought out um, beforehand can really help you to see like, okay, is the in intervention or a design that I'm working on, am I just coming to an existing community and saying, here, take this? Or am I really trying to create a, um, a relationship that goes both ways, which is much more of a collaboration as opposed to a one-way relationship? Um, and then just kind of quickly, two other sets of tools that we have as one um, being the 
uh, the newspaper tool, uh, we call it. Um, it's, it's quite simple in terms of its design, uh, but the idea is that you get together with the community that you're going to be working with um, and you create a collective vision together. So you basically um, write a, a title for a, um, for a newspaper, imagining what would be the, the title uh, or what would be the news story five years from now or 10 years from now regarding your initiative and the community you're working on and your collaboration together. So what would that look like? Uh, and the idea is trying to come at, to some sort of consensus with the community that you're working with and also see how different people might envision different futures. Um, and the tools as well with the Cisco that were developed also has other strategies for how you can um, co-develop a vision together. Um, and then lastly, um, we talk about communicating your project as well. So uh, engaging with the community and getting um, getting in there and getting your hands dirty is super important, but you also need to understand how to then communicate your project um, to not just the community, your direct community, but new communities that might be interested in working with you or you might be interested in working with them. Um, and so there's a tool to help you um, uh, basically list the, the inputs that you might have um, and help you understand how you could format those inputs. Um, so if, for example, uh, like one of our um, innovators that's involved in both food shift and distributed design platform, um, this innovator called Domingo Club, they build uh, a they built a fermentation chamber um, to ferment tempeh principally. And so that might be an input. It's like we built the, the, the fermentation chamber. Um, so then you decide, okay, now how do I wanna share that information? Is it through a video? Is it through a podcast, uh, a blog post? And then where would be the channels that you distribute that? So if it's a blog post, is it on your website, on your, um, a newsletter. Um, also, the idea too that if you have a podcast, for example, then you can break it down and make it into a blog post as well. Um, and really trying to maximize how you uh, like the type of content, um, how it can work for you. Um, so there's also kind of a stakeholder engagement dissemination plan. So for the different stakeholders, you have how. Um, can you transmit this information? And then uh, there's a video as well on um, uh, on how you can um, on, well best practices for communicating uh, your message and what it is that you're doing to different audiences. Um, and there is one more tool that Jessica actually might have mentioned the other week, um, but it is the distributed design platform reflection tree. Um, and this is meant to be used really at the starting stage of your, uh, of your design or your work, um, but you can also use it at any time, but it's a tool to help you uh, reflect on where you're on where your project is on its journey to becoming distributed design. So engaging with these different values of open, collaborative, um, regenerative, and ecosystemic, and uh, how you are kind of uh, already doing that and how you might like to do it better. So you essentially um, get asked a series of uh, questions at different design state or different intervention stages. Um, for example, like, um, the uh, the design is completely open source and you rank yourself from zero to five of how true that affirmation is for you um, to help you see, okay, really how open is your project and to give you kind of this diagnostic tool and then help you identify too what are the areas you'd like to improve in. And that also comes with a group of resources. Um, so, that's about it for me. Um, that also, uh, if you do want to explore any of these um, examples or tools that I mentioned more, um, you can click through any of these. Um, and I will share this presentation with uh, Veronica and Ola so that they can share it on with you as well. 
Um, and as well, if you have any questions, um, you can reach me at sally at fatlabbarcelona.org. Um, my email is right here. Oops. Okay. Moved. Now it's there. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk with you today and, and looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. That was um, very inspiring, very refreshing. Um, are there any questions from anyone? Yeah. Hello, I have a question. First of all, I want to say thank you for such a good presentation and a very good speech. And I have a question uh, about the communication with communities. In our project, uh, what we want to create during this plot, we want to communicate with uh, children in schools. And uh, we can say that this is the community too. And uh, what you can say about the communication with these children communities? Yeah. Are there any special moments to communicate to them and so on? So that's a really nice question because working with kids is a is a whole different um, uh, type of community and maybe type of way of communicating. Um, I'm also going to bring in some of my. I, I was a English teacher for several years as well um, to all different age kids, so I'll bring in some of that knowledge too. Um, but in terms of communicating with them, you really have to ensure that your message is clear so that they understand like why you're here or why you're engaging with them and what is it that you want from them in um in the intervention um and also is really adapting the language to make sure that it's digestible uh to students of the age that you're working with um so i would really recommend uh, finding a sibling or a cousin uh, that you can practice with a little at the beginning and just see what is the language that they do and don't understand um, because you might have a really great intervention but if you explain it as um, to a kid using the same exact words that you might use to talk amongst yourselves um, it's quite possible that they don't um, they don't understand what you're saying um, so i would definitely say like really practice using more uh, kind of um, more simple language and um, still, I mean, kids are amazing. They understand so, so much, um, but maybe just trying to stay away from like jargon terminology um, that might be more easy to understand if you're a professional in the field. Um, so I would say those are kind of two, two big um, tips, but yeah, if you can find a kid around the age that you're going to be doing your intervention with, and, and kind of um, practice a little bit with that child, if that's okay with them, that's probably your best way to find out if how you're communicating is appropriate for that age group or not. Did that answer your question? You could also feel free to ask us. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Do we have anyone else? Um, so maybe if, if you don't mind, I have one question. I was wondering, um, was someone saying something? I, I said, of course. I think it might have been oh, me. All right, okay. I thought maybe there's other participant trying to ask something. Yeah. Um, what I what I am wondering about, and maybe you have some insight into that, is um, is that fab labs are they have dual roles in a way. They have dual focus. So on one hand, you have them as the some sort of hubs of innovation where where we change the paradigm, we shift the paradigm of thinking. Uh, on the other hand, we talk about fab labs being centers for communities or doing interventions for commu with communities and engaging them um, and I'm not saying those things are mutually exclusive but they don't require I can imagine some sort of balancing and maybe you could share if there are some challenges coming from that or or maybe opportunities that you see in this yeah um, 
So I think, and that's a, a really nice question, Ola. Thank you, um, because I think this is something that comes up a, a lot, um, and you do see, um, as I was saying before, there are for every fab lab, there's a different way of running, um, and so there might be some fab labs that are much more focused on how can we make this paradigm shift and less focused on interventions with the community, whereas there might be others that are um, really, um, really based around understanding a community need, like creating or making a, um, a new uh, bookshelf for a community library, um, like one of those free libraries. Um, and they're meeting those changes. But I think this is also part of the paradigm shift itself. So um, actually really empowering communities again to be able to take back making and democratize that process. Um, and also just sharing that moment with each other to make like that's to me that's super, super radical. Because right now the system that it, we're in um, has us so far distanced from the processes of making uh, for the most part. Um, like everyday people are, we're not, we're not citizens with agency so much in these spaces of making. We're consumers and someone comes along and say, this is what you need. You buy this or you can buy this option or you can buy this option. You get 50 million options to choose from, um, but you didn't actually get a say in making any of those and you didn't get to give your personal input in deciding whether that's even something that's necessary for you to buy. So I, I think in the sense that there are fab labs that are um, functioning as kind of community spaces is already um, a way that that's being united with this paradigm shift um, because it's it's creating not only like a physical space, but also um, the kind of mental space that we can be sharing the making process and doing it together um, and participating in a process that can be also much more empowering as opposed to when we're simply like receiving as consumers. It makes, it makes me think a little bit about food chains and how de-attached often, especially within the cities we are from that. Um, how little do we know about the food that, that we put on the table? Um, that's great, yeah. I was wondering if you have any tips um, for, for our participants as to, I mean, of course, you shared the tools and that's very useful for mm -hmm. them, I can imagine, and I'm sure I will also use it. Um, but I was wondering if you have any tips on how to start working within communities because i can imagine when you are at the university it's very easy um, to insert yourself within certain networks or have have people around you that can help you or navigate you towards those communities that might be your um so to say target group mm -hmm. but quite often when we are outside of that environment it gets a bit tricky or maybe we have some you know um issues reaching out to certain groups or certain people maybe you have some uh some tips so final final words for for us yeah um so this is a really tricky process like you said it can be really easy if you're already in touch with a community like if it's one that you're already a part of you already have a sense of trust you already know how the community functions um and so it's easier to then say to that community like hey i have this idea um, that we might collaborate on that we might develop together I'm, or I'm identifying this need that we collectively have what do you think about trying to apply um, this intervention um, it's much easier to do that when you're already engaged in the community but when it's a community you don't know um, that that process is much more difficult so first you have to find the community uh, you have to find the one that kind of is the right fit um, and to do that, I, I think one of the best tools is finding somebody that is really engaged in the community and the community, like in the sense of um, in your town or in your city that really kind of knows a lot of people and maybe asking them and saying, hey, I have this idea, um, but I'm not really sure 
where uh, it might land. Do you have any ideas? And that person might be able to put you in touch with um, the right association or different communities uh, that could be interested. But the first thing when you get there um, wouldn't be to just arrive and say, hey, I have this idea that I think you're really going to like. It's really just to listen and stop and and don't think about what it is that you want to do, but think about how you can be part of this group of people um, and how you can have a reciprocal relationship with them. But also before you even doing that is just understanding more about them, understanding their motivations, uh, understanding what brings them together as a group of people and um, yeah, just listening to them and through that, you'll eventually start to build trust with them. Um, but that's, it's a slow process. It's, it, which is probably why so many um, designers and projects and companies don't do this because it is a, it's, it is a time commitment um, and an energy commitment. Um, but at least from our perspective, um, integrating yourself in a community first and really trying to understand them um, is a much more effective way to creating solutions that are really going to make the impact that you're hoping to see. Um, so once you are kind of have more of that trust, then from that space, being able to go and suggest um, your idea and, and see how that lands, or even not suggest your idea, but say um, hosting a session um, to help identify or better identify needs the community has. Um, this, these are different options that you might have. But once again, it's a slow process, but much, really worth it at the level of producing interventions that are really going to have the impact that you're hoping for. Um, and I guess another really important point there is really considering the different power dynamics that might be at play. Um, like, for example, from Fab Lab Barcelona's perspective, when we engage with a community, we are incredibly aware of the fact that um, this community might not have funding, might be operating out of people's um, uh, just their interest and in, as a hobby, as a passion, um, or maybe they're looking for funding uh, for whatever it is that they're trying to do, um, or even like a group of businesses, for example. And we're coming from a a privileged position in which we already have funding. Um, we are literally getting uh, paid to do these interventions. So acknowledging that and, and seeing also opportunities where um, you can give back to the communities that you're working with, um, not just uh, constantly uh, going through kind of what we refer to as brain drain with them, but inviting them to sessions, getting their ideas, and then inviting them to somewhere else, getting their ideas and, and not giving back other than not just like the intervention at the end that might give back, but how might you have to find other points to give back to them, whether it's then hiring them to give a workshop um, or being able to even pay for their time. Um, those are also tools that are really encouraged um, because there, there always is power dynamics of sorts. So it's really important to recognize what those are um, and acknowledge them from the beginning. I think actually it's a, um, or it, it is potentially an interesting topic by itself about getting the fundings to do your intervention because one thing is to design them, right? Or to think about ideas and the other is to actually try to find, especially if you're outside of organization, to try to find some fundings to, to implement it. Yeah. It's a challenge, right? Yeah, and this is a, a difficult and often competitive process. Um, so it's a, also for us, at least we tried to see ways that we can, like innovators that we've started engaging with um, and communities we started engaging with, we try to look for ways that when we are applying for funding for projects that we can write them into the project um, as a, a, a participant so that they do get a budget line um, at the very least for some of the activities they're doing. Um, but it, it depends where you are as well. Like we're quite lucky in Barcelona, there are a lot of um, 
public funding opportunities available. They can be quite competitive, um, but a lot of associations and innovators and designers are able to apply for them and get funding for their projects that way. Um, and I think this has to do with Barcelona's commitment to the social and solidarity economy is seeing these initiatives that are operating outside of the traditional paradigm of just how much money can I make and how quickly can I make it? Um, so there's quite a lot of support, but this definitely isn't the case everywhere. Um, so it's, yeah, this is a very like context-based um, description or examples as well. I can imagine it even varies within the same country from city to city, right? Yeah. And the councils and such. Um, yeah, but I think it's a it's a it's a beautiful note to finish on what you said about um, that. And I agree there, and I definitely subscribe to that idea that we as designers or makers and creators, one of our stronger strongest tool is to observe and to listen and to engage. I find it very um, beautiful note to to finish this lecture on, unless someone else has some questions. Uh, but I don't see any raised hands. Um, so with that, thank you very much. It was very, very um, insightful. I think it was great food for thoughts. I can imagine a lot of participants will take something for their own projects. Um, and well, yeah, it was great to have you. Yeah, it was great to be here. Thank you again so much for inviting me. And I'm looking forward to seeing the the outcomes of the Splat UA residency. Great. I think um, by the end of the month, quite probably, um, 